The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jenny Briggle from TechServe Alliance. Welcome to the certification webinar series. Today's webinar is Systems, Ethics, and Your Bottom Line. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation. So feel free to write in any questions you would like to have answered in the question box on the right side of your screen. Also, we are recording today's presentation, and it will be available to TechServe members on the eLearning Center of the website. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the day, Barb Bruno, President of Good as Gold Training. Barb? Thanks so much, Jennifer. I appreciate your introduction, and it's always a pleasure for me to speak to the members of TechServe Alliance. I, I've said many times that I feel the TechServe Alliance does one of the best jobs of representing their membership, so I do appreciate you spending this time with me. Um, today we're going to discuss three topics that are covered by the certification program that TechServe Alliance uh, rolled out last year, and these topics are systems, ethics, and your bottom line. The certification program is basically divided into three segments. We did industry practices, then legal, and then best practices for recruiters and account executives. What we're going to discuss in today's session is, you know, the impact of industry practices, common terms and definitions, um, ethics in today's competitive marketplace, and how systems and processes impact your bottom line. So let's start out by the impact of industry practices. Uh, the body of knowledge contained in the industry practices addresses exemplary practices that should be implemented by management, account executives, recruiters in the fulfillment of their professional roles. You know, the, the impact of, of strong industry practices starts at the top. It starts with the owner of the firm and it goes through every single person that is part of your team. Clients and candidates are basically very confused by the many changes impacting our profession. And learning and implementing industry practices helps you differentiate both yourself and your firm from your competition. It always kills me when I'm in front of an audience, and I just did 16 conferences in the last 14 weeks. You know, spring is always a heavy conference time, so is fall. And the one thing that always amazes me is I ask every audience I'm in front of, whether it's account executives, recruiters, or leadership, and I'll say, you know, what, why I'm a client, why should I use your firm as opposed to your competitors? Give me something your competitors can't say. And then I'll go to recruiters. You know, I'm a candidate. I'm your ideal person. I'm a person you could place out on a contract almost instantly. Tell me why I should send you my resume as opposed to other people that do exactly what you do but don't say what they can say. And what's interesting, you know, is that all the eyes hit the floor. Now your you know, recruiters and account executives are making these calls every day. But when I truly get into what really differentiates you, you know, both yourself, you know, and your firm from everybody else, nobody can come up with something that's different. They'll say, Well, we specialize in IT, you know, we're we're a local company, you know, we've you know, we've been here forever. We thoroughly interview our candidates. And I speak to quite a few audiences that are talent acquisition professionals and decision makers. And I've done that intentionally. And one of their biggest complaints is that we all say we're different, but then we're asked how we're, we're different. We all say the same thing. And you also need everybody in your company working from the same playbook because that just results in higher sales and profits. You know, it, it, there, there's, no, it, there's no surprise that franchises have a much higher level of success because everything is structured. I've always said to owners and managers, set up your business like a franchise, where if somebody came up to you today and said, I have $5 million, I want you to open two more offices just like your office, and I want to be an investor, could you do it? You know, are all your desks set up identical? Are there processes and procedures? Are you implementing exemplary industry practices as your people are working their desks every day? Because that truly does increase the value and profits of your firm and increases the sales. There's many uh, common terms and definitions. In fact, I laugh because in our profession, we're upgrading our certification program for the fall, you know, before the TSA conference in fall, because there's so many new acronyms that we use. You know, 10 years ago, nobody heard of a VMS or an RPO. Or, I mean, it's just amazing how many new terms and definitions hit our profession. And to better serve your clients and candidates and to elevate your knowledge base, it's important that you understand all these commonly used terms and definitions. Even if your company doesn't offer certain services, you have to be aware of everything because your clients 
are utilizing those services and if they use these terms you have to understand them so we basically took the top 50 terms and definitions and put them in the certification study guide but I want to give you some samples of some of the terms that are included when we talk about alternative staffing you know alternative staffing really includes all non-traditional flexible work other than direct permanent full-time employment so this includes temporaries and contractors consultants part-time workers self-employed and independent contractors um, let's go to the term employee leasing the core employees of a business are transferred to the leading firms payroll and benefit resources the leasing firm basically provides payroll accounting personnel management um, employment benefits risk administration and all the human resource functions in addition they offer management consulting and expertise to the subscribing business and again do you know are there a lot of companies out there that are using employee leasing companies and just turning over these functions to someone else the answer is yes you know it you know 15 20 years ago you know a lot of these things didn't even exist and where they did exist they were the exception rather than the norm but now there's just so many different ways of doing business um, the definition of an independent contractor you know an independent contractor is somebody who provides services to a company but but is not an employee of the company the company pays the independent contractor without withholding payroll taxes or paying the employer's share of payroll taxes an independent contractor has the right to decide how the work will be done and may hire others to assist or do the work independent contractors also do not receive wages the IRS and states hold independent contractors under intense scrutiny because of abuses costing billions of tax dollars and if you're ever wondering about the IRS definition of an independent contractor because there are you know there many audits are being done in our profession where you know they're they're testing is this person really an independent contractor and if you're wondering just go to www.irs.gov gov and you know type in the words independent contractor and it will give you all the criteria that must be there for somebody to qualify as an independent contractor and a lot of companies are hiring independent contractors where their independent contractors are really not hitting that definition and so you know the many companies that are being audited are now turning those people over to contractors and looking for firms like you to be able to utilize your services to get that done so when you're making your you know your your client development calls you know you want to ask them about the 1099 employees and have they thought about you know converting them over to a contractor um, you know if in fact they don't you know hit the IRS definition of what a 1099 employee truly is MSP refers to managed service provider this refers to an organization that manages a customer computer system and networks which are either located on the customer premise or at a third-party data center and these companies offer a variety of service levels from just notifying the customer if a problem occurs to making all repairs MSP may also be a source for hardware and staff for its customers uh, that leads me to our last definition today um, and again we have 50 of these in the study guide you know uh, that are all accepted definitions right now and again you may not do any of these things but should you be aware of them the answer is yes what about an RPO or BPO the recruitment process outsourcing um, this is a form of business processing outsourcing where an employer outsources or transfers all or part of their recruitment activities to an external service provider the recruitment process outsource outsourcing association defines RPO as the following when a provider acts as a company's internal recruitment function for a portion of all of its jobs so the RPO providers manage the entire recruiting hiring process from job profiling through the onboarding of the new hire including staff technology method and reporting a properly managed RPO will improve a company's time to hire increase the quality of the candidate pool provide verifiable metrics and reduce cost and improve governmental compliance so those are all great motivators for companies to utilize you know recruitment process outsourcing companies I now want to go to our next topic of today's webinar which is ethics in today's competitive marketplace it's interesting because when you're talking to the general public you know for all intents and purposes most people feel that ethics 
and customer service are things of the past. You know, and it's sad that people feel that way. Um, in contract staffing firms, you know, customize their business models and structures to accommodate their clients and candidates. And most recruiters and account executives interact with candidates and clients and their competitors on a you know pretty regular basis. It's for that reason that it really is imperative to incorporate a code of ethics that promotes the highest standards of ethical contact as it relates to candidates, clients, and competitors. And when you think about what we do for a living, I mean, we're, we're really impacting people's lives. And we can either really enhance their careers, you know, the careers of the candidates we represent, and we can really enhance our clients' ability to hit their goals by placing the best people in jobs, or we can hurt them by not doing our job properly. You know, we're, we're selling the lives of people, you know, and, and when you place somebody in an opportunity, you're not only impacting them, you're impacting everybody they love, you know, their family, their friends, because we all relate to what we do for a living. And so that's why, you know, basically TSA, you know, came up with a code of ethics and anybody that becomes certified says that they do adhere to the code of ethics. And I want to go into some of the criteria about the code of ethics and I'm going to break it down when it comes to interaction with candidates, clients, and competitors. So let's start out with the interaction with candidates. I want to give you three samples of the TSA Code of Ethics when dealing with candidates. There's quite a few more, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go through three of them. Uh, the first one is you preserve the confidentiality of all the confidential information of your candidates. You know, we find out a tremendous amount. We ask people questions that their family members or their best friends don't ask them, and of course, all that information must remain confidential. That we do not intentionally misrepresent a candidate's pay rate, their contract terms, the assignment duration, or other facts that are relevant to the business relationship that we have with candidates. And we never, you know, we never knowingly induce candidates to breach or improperly interfere with a contractual relationship. So if they're on contract with somebody else, you know, we're not going to improperly interfere you know, or entice or induce a candidate to breach their current contract. Now let's move over now of, of three samples of the Code of Ethics when you're dealing with your clients. First of all, as you would adhere to the tenet of equal opportunity for all candidates, regardless of race, religion, color, sex, creed, age, marital status, sexual orientation, or national origin. You do not intentionally misrepresent a candidate's skill or experience to your clients, and you comply with the client's established business practices, including those policies relating to gifts and gratuity to a client's employees. You know, I know many of you might have a, a client referral process, and again, a client referral program is one of the best way to land new clients, you know, but most companies, you know, there's laws like Sarbanes-Oxley and different restrictions where many companies do not allow their employees to take gifts. You know, what my firm has done, just kind of an FYI and an idea I want to throw out there, when, when we have a client that refers somebody to us and they actually hire from us, we donate to the company's, um, you know, whatever interest they have. So we donate to their favorite charity. And their charity could be something like the Cancer Association or, you know, uh, MS or, you know, um, you know, there's, there's so many different charities out there. Or it could be the, the client's church. It could be their, their child's little league team. But when we started doing this, when we started donating to their favorite charity in their name, our client referrals quadrupled in less than a year. And we had always gotten, you know, quite a few client referrals. We've always worked at getting referrals from our current clients. But, boy, when we put something in there, the what's in it for them to give us a referral, when we started donating to their favorite charity, it really did you know, greatly enhance our referrals. So if you're not getting a lot of client referrals, I just wanted to throw that idea out to you because it is something that works. But again, you've got to know your clients, you know, business practices and policies in, in regard to this. Usually donating to a favorite charity is, is an acceptable, you know, proposal. And everybody wins. The charity wins. You win because you write it off as a, you know, as a donation. The charity wins because of the donation, and it's most companies have that philanthropic endeavor, you know, and, and this helps, you know, it basically helps them donate to the causes they care about. I now want to go to three examples of the TSA Code of Ethics when dealing with competitors. You need to adhere to the tenet of equal opportunity for all candidates, regardless of, you know, race, age, religion, color, creed, age, marital status, sexual orientation, or national origin. 
you want to abide by all applicable applicable federal, state, and local laws in performance of your duties, and you don't want to defame your competitors. You know, if somebody complains about one of your competitors and tells you how bad they are, you don't want to go, yeah, that's what we've heard. They're really bad. They don't do their job. Because when you're doing that, you're basically talking about our profession. And so when you're discussing competitors, you want to take the high road, and you never want to say anything negative, and this is all part of the Code of Ethics of TSA. And basically, the reason TSA created the Code of Ethics was to promote the highest standards of ethical contact when dealing with candidates, clients, and competitors. You know, they established standards based on exemplary practices for account executives and recruiters, but also for owners and managers and the leadership of the, you know, contract staffing and recruiting firms that are represented by TechServe Alliance. Adherence to these ethical practices provides you with a competitive edge and it elevates your level of professionalism and again it's a differentiator you know for you in the IT and engineering contract staffing niches and so when they're asking you why are you different you can say I'm you know I'm certified I have the highest professional designation that is you know awarded by my professional association and plus as a person who's certified you know I adhere to the highest standards the highest code of ethics you know, and, and it's just, it's just again, it's another differentiator in the marketplace. Now, let's talk about how systems and procedures impact your bottom line. And what I want you to think about for a minute is what I brought up at the very beginning, that your office should really be, you know, able to duplicate very easily because you've got systems and procedures in place. You know, you know the stats and numbers. Everybody's desk is set up similar. It was interesting because I did some training in South Africa two years ago, and, and I found that the most successful firms in South Africa, you know, they had some very, very large firms, and the most successful firms were the one that everybody's desk was set up exact. You know, they had definite procedures and systems in place, and it was interesting because when I was there, I am not a fast food person at all. Um, I just don't eat fast food, but it was difficult finding food in many of the locations I was training in South Africa. And I saw McDonald's, and I thought, okay, that has to be pretty close to McDonald's in the United States, so I'm just going to try this. And it was identical. It was, it was funny going in one in a different country, and pretty much everything was the same, except when I asked for ketchup, and they asked if I wanted tomato sauce. And by the way, their ketchup did taste like tomato sauce. And when I asked for a napkin, they looked at me like I was crazy. And a napkin in South Africa is a receiving blanket for a baby. So they're looking for the baby, or they call it a serviette. And so other than those two changes, it was identical. It's, it, there's no mistake, you know, in, in the benefit of having your business set up like a franchise. You know, the reason that franchises give business owner you know, owners a better chance of success when they're in the restaurant field or retail or, you know, other, other endeavors is because of the procedures. It's because of the processes and procedures and everybody is doing things the same way. I want you to think about all the benefits that systems and processes provide for your business. Number one, when you have set systems and processes and everybody is, you know, basically doing their job from the same playbook. They've all been trained identical. You're going to attain goal set. You know, expectations are very clear. You know, your employees know what management expects. Management knows what the employees expect. Your candidates and clients know what to expect. Expectations are clear. You will have increased sales and profits. And what, what procedures and systems help you do is make very fair and consistent decisions in your work environment, and that improves morale. You know, you can't shoot from the hip anymore, you know, and most firms in our profession are growing right now because the market is strong. You know, a candidate-driven market is very good for our profession. You know, and in every single conference I went to, I had recruiters just, you know, just, just really complaining about how hard it is to find candidates, and I said, you should be celebrating. And they always looked at me like I was nuts, and I said, no, seriously, if it was easy to find candidates, you wouldn't have a job. You couldn't charge the margins you're charging. Your company would not be in business. When it's really hard to find talent, that's when it's best for all of you. you know. But again, systems and processes do help your ability to grow. I know there are many companies right now that are not growing. You know, and, and when I look at different industries, like I look at oil and gas right now, and you have many people in oil and gas that are just, they're just, you know, complaining consistently. Unless they're involved in drilling, oil and gas is still very lucrative. And I have many other training clients that are just flourishing right now. 
you know, so if, you know, when, when you're blaming the market or blaming certain things, you've got to look at are you following processes and systems that no matter what the economy does, you know what you have to do to consistently, you know, attain the goals that are set. The reputation and the quality of services provided improve when systems and processes are created and they're implemented by 100% of the people that work for you. You know, following are three of the ten examples of systems and processes that we included in our certification study guide that are implemented by many of the successful IT and engineering contract staffing firms. And so I do want to go over three of the ten examples. Number one would be client development and marketing. You know, do you have a set marketing plan? You know, do do are you know does your client development people or your salespeople targeting the highest business where they can get the highest gross margin of profit? Have you conducted revenue modeling to identify your best business? You know, you, you can't just let salespeople go out there and land whatever business. Have you really done revenue modeling to to study where you've been successful in the past so you know where to put 85% of your sales efforts? Have you identified and repeat successful sales processes both for your inside and outside sales team. Sales is a repeatable process. And you know, I, it kills me when I go inside of some firms. You know, some firms will bring me inside to do in-house consulting and I look and everybody's kind of shooting from the hip doing their own thing. You know, and, and here you've had a lot of success and most of you that are on this phone, you know, you're in a niche where probably most of you are experiencing great success right now. But when you're looking at your sales, there's a process. What process do your people follow to have a sale close? You know, you have to get your arm and your heads around that. You know, what is it specifically that is part of your repeatable sales process? And then all you do is you keep fine-tuning that sales process. You don't keep reinventing the wheel or having everybody in your company try to figure out what their process is. Figure out what's worked for you in the past and then just keep enhancing and improving your repeatable sales process. And that way it also makes, you know, onboarding of new people in your team much easier because they have a process to follow. Minimum standards. Minimum standards are extremely important because what minimum standards do is they align accountability and performance. Minimum standards clearly set out the expectations of your owner or manager. You know, your owner or manager is in business to generate profits not provide jobs for the people that work for them. You know, and minimum standards also allow leadership to make tough decisions based on numbers versus emotions because numbers don't lie. You know, when you're basing major decisions on emotion, you can make mistakes. But, you know, every one of you need to know your numbers, you know, and, and minimum standards help set the numbers that you know you need to achieve. Minimum standards should become part of the hiring process, they should become part of the employee handbook, job descriptions, and performance reviews. You know, this is a SOP, a standard operating procedure that ensures success and profits for you as well as your company. Because in all reality, you know, your, your employer doesn't write your paycheck, you do. You know, most people in our profession are paid on performance. The beauty about that is, is that there's no limits on what you can do. You know, just imagine what your life would be like if your annual income became your monthly income. I threw that challenge out at a TSA conference. I think it was six years ago that I had an audience. And, and I said, you know, just imagine what would happen if your annual income became your monthly income. And I had four or five people come up to me and they said, Barbara, is that possible? And I said, you're in one of the few professions where it is. Even if you just increase your numbers by 10%, across the board, you're going to up your production by 30%. And they said, how long will it take us? And I said, if you really want to do this, I'll guide you. So I took those three or four people under my wing because they, they were set at trying to accomplish this, and they all did. Now, the funny thing was I said that in front of an audience of probably 500 people, and I only had three or four people come up to me at the end, and three really were the ones that said we're going to do this, and those are the ones I took under my wing. But, you know, it, it, just imagine that. Imagine how your life would change, you know, if, if, in fact, you know, your annual income became your monthly income. How would the life of the people you love change if you were earning that kind of money? Because your owner or manager is never going to say, stop, you've made enough sales, stop. You know, we have enough this month. Don't make any more phone calls. Don't match any more. Don't make any presentations. You know, don't land any more clients. We have more than enough. You are never going to hear that, are you? And so any limits you feel on your income or your growth have been put there by you. You know, we all have our own financial thermostat. 
and minimum standards of performance really show you what results you need every day, you know, in order to consistently hit your goals, which leads me to numbers and ratios, the most important system that you have to have in place. The IT and engineering contract staffing profession is a sales profession, which means it's a numbers game. It is critical for you to track numbers daily and weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually. And once you've tracked your numbers for 90 days, you can determine your individual ratios. And these stats and ratios should be reviewed quarterly throughout your entire career. I don't care if you have one year of experience or 25 years of experience. You know, you've got to know your individual ratios because the beauty about this is, is once you know your individual ratios, you now know exactly what results you need daily to consistently hit or surpass goals. You'll never have a flat month because you know what results you need every single day. And if you don't get those results one day, you add that number to the following day, it doesn't go away. You know, you know exactly what results you need every day. And you hear I'm not saying numbers of phone calls, because if I know what I have to do, if I know I'm a recruiter and I have to interview three people a day, and I know I have to do that, then I have to set up four or five a day because somebody's going to no show, somebody's going to cancel. And if I need to do three a day or 15 a week to hit my production goals, then if I do two today, I've got to do four tomorrow. And the reason I'm telling you to book five interviews instead of three is because you want to allow for the people that aren't going to be there. But that's when the job becomes fun. That's when, you know, you know, most recruiters tell me, I feel like I'm in Las Vegas spinning the wheel. You know, are they going to take the job? Are they not? Are they going to show up for their interview? Or are they not? You know, is my client going to make an offer? Are they not? It doesn't have to be that way. When you know your individual ratios and stats, you'll know exactly what you have to do every day. And it just takes the pressure off of you. And you're not going to have that roller coaster, great month, bad month, great month, bad month. The reason that happens is because when you're having a great month, you're closing and prepping and debriefing and celebrating, and you don't do the you don't do the the basic tasks you have to do every day. Those results you need every day to ensure production and ensure consistency. Tracking numbers and stats has to become a daily habit, and determining stats for the month based on the number of working days of each month helps you determine the following: today's stats, your month-to-date stats, and your goals for the month. See, if you don't know how many working days there are in this month, then you're not managing yourself by numbers. You know, we know exactly how many working days there are in every month. And you have to know that because you've got to know exactly what you have to do to those days, you know, in order to consistently hit your goals. And the beautiful part about numbers is they don't lie. You know, you can lie to yourself. You can say, well, you know, it was the candidate's fault, it was the client's fault. When you're dealing with numbers, that's why I always suggest, even when you're talking to candidates or clients, you also use on a scale of 1 to 10. Because if you say, are you interested? Yes. You know, is this one of your finalists? Yes. If you go on a scale of 1 to 10, people will they'll say, I'm really interested. Well, what about on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest? Well, I'm a 4. And, you, and, you're, and you're thinking they're a 10. And so when you want to quantify, when you're having conversations, this also is not in today's program. But what I think of things as I'm doing these, these lunch and training, I want to give you as much as I can, you know, to help you make more money. So, you know, when you're talking to candidates, when you're talking to clients, always quantify on a scale of 1 to 10. I even did that with my kids. I have five children. And they would say something, oh, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is this? 10 being extremely important, 1 being not really not that important. Because I learned, you know, having five children, when I had five teenagers, I had to quantify to just figure out if it was emotion or if it was truth, you know. And it's one of the best ways to manage yourself and never have a slump and become a consistent producer. Tracking stats allows you to identify problem areas also, you know, before they result in major issues or slumps. You know, you can tell. In the last recession in 2009, that recession actually started before the last quarter of 2008. And we could tell in our office because all of a sudden our, our ratios were going up. And they were going up across the board for all of our team, whether they were an account executive or a recruiter. So we realized things were starting to tighten up. And so you don't throw your hands up and say, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be a long one. This is going to be a tough one. You've got to double or triple the amount of calls you make to get half of the results you normally get. But that's what you have to do. You know, and numbers really does, it's like an insurance policy. You know, when you're monitoring your numbers, you know, you can identify slumps way before they become news, and you can anticipate changes in the market, you know, when ratios begin to increase. The minute you see your ratios increase, you know something's going on. 
and we basically have have you know we're right in that the middle of the market we know quicker than just about anybody else when things are starting to happen and you either put your head in the sand and say I don't want to think about this or you start altering the way you work your desk so that you maintain your production and it's interesting you know when you focus on the results you need to attain goal set you're going to start in you're going to start enjoying knowing exactly what you need to accomplish every day to enjoy the lifestyle that you deserve you know, when you're looking at the house you live in or the car you drive or the vacations you take or don't take, or do you have college funds for your kids or do you have a retirement program, you control all of that. You know, but you can't continue working your desk the same way and expect to get different results. You've got to shake things up. Most of us are in our comfort zone the majority of our life. You know, without even realizing it, you're on automatic pilot. What I want all of you to do is, you know, envision this big light switch on your chest and just turn it off and become much more aware of the actions you're taking and decisions you're making and results you're getting. And I can tell you that, you know, that, that implementing some of the things we've talked about today, you know, if you're not monitoring your numbers and ratios, it'll change your life. It'll absolutely change your life and it'll take the mystery out of what you do for a living and you're not going to have that inconsistent production. Today's webinar, what I've done today is provided you sort of with a sneak peek at the amazing wealth of knowledge contained in the TSA certification program. If you truly want to differentiate yourself from the competition, better serve your clients and candidates and increase sales and profits, you know, I would strongly suggest that you consider registering for the TSA certification program. Because, you know, when I wrote the program, when TSA came to me to write the study guide, you know, of best practices for both account executives and recruiters. The only reason I got involved, and I told TSA, my goal is that anybody that goes through the TSA certification program ends up making more money. And I can tell you when I'm doing prep classes for larger companies or prep classes for some of the TSA chapters around the country, I get a ton of emails back from owners saying, oh my God, I wish I had sent everybody to that prep class because they came back so knowledgeable and were making more money. So the nice part about the TSA certification program is you're going to get a really strong return on your investment. Not only are your people going to get certified, but you're going to increase sales and profits. And those of you that are listening to me that are account executives and recruiters, if you want to go from where you are now to where you deserve to be, the knowledge and the information in that TSA study guide and by you know studying for that program, you will be armed with, with more knowledge and knowledge you know, the implementation of that knowledge is what can take you from where you are now to where you want to be. So I would strongly suggest that any of you register today for the TSA certification program. Um, if you want additional information, all you have to do is you can contact TechServe Alliance by going to certification at techserveralliance.org or you can call Susan Donahoe and there's Susan's phone number and her extension. You know, and if you go on the site, even if you go, you know, if you Google Tech Serve Alliance and Certification and you go to the website, there is a tremendous amount of information on the website as far as pricing and how you take the exam and how you get the study guides. But wouldn't would it be great if you just decided that this is something you're going to do in the summer months, that you want to have a record second and third quarter, and so you make the commitment today to do this. What I'd like to do now is open this for questions, and your questions can be about anything. Your questions don't have to be about the topics today because the reason that I said I would do these calls live is I truly do care about all of you and I truly do want any of you to be able to ask me questions. And so if there's any question you have about working your desk, about it could be about a close that's going south, it could be about anything. The only questions I will not answer are owner questions. If you're going to ask me questions about compensation or commissions or owner topics because we may have some recruiters and account executives on the phone and I don't want, you know, this is not an owner only call and so when I'm, you know, when I've got a general audience I don't answer owner questions. But let me see if there's any questions. We've got a lot of people on this line and I do, you know, I do basically thank all of you for joining us because you're giving your valuable time to learn and that shows something, you know. And, and I do want to say to all of you, coming to these calls, and I'm going to be doing a call, you know, once a month, lunch with Barb, you know, uh, signing up for the call and being here is step one. You've got to really think about this call and what is the one thing you learned today that you could take back and implement? Because if you just come to these calls and you say, God, it was great information, but you don't implement anything, it's not going to impact your income. It's only when you change something. And it takes 21 days of repetition before you learn something new. Um, I'm from Chicago, and 
And I remember watching Michael Jordan. You'd always see the rubber band around his wrist, a big colored rubber band. And people would always ask him, what's that for? And he said, I'm trying to change a shot. And he goes, it takes repetition for me to finally do it naturally. And he would leave a rubber band around his wrist for 21 days to remind him. Every time he went up to shoot it, shoot the ball, you know, he would look at that rubber band and it would remind him, wait a minute, you know, you're supposed to do it the other way. Wouldn't it be great if you decided I'm going to change something for the next 21 days and you put a colored rubber band around your wrist and your office is going to wonder, what are you doing? And your family is going to wonder, what are you doing that you've got a rubber band around your wrist? But it will remind you because it takes 21 days of repetition, 21 business working days of repetition before you replace an old habit with a new habit. When you're under stress and you're under pressure, you're going to go back to your old habits. That's why dieting doesn't work. You know, you got to change your lifestyle or the way, basically the way you view food and eating. It's the same thing in our desk, you know, in order to change a habit. And all of you have habits. You know, when you came to your office today, you pretty much probably drove the same way to work. You probably had set habits when you came to work. And when you sat at your desk, you have some habits that are developed. Some are good, some are bad. But what I would love to do is I want you out of your comfort zone. You know, if you never feel uneasy and you never feel kind of stressed out when you're working your desk, that means you're not trying anything new and you're not growing. You've got to continually grow and change, especially in your area, your niche, that continually changes. You know, and, and the other thing, too, is if you're looking for a differentiator, there are not that many people. This is a new program. If you get your certification, is that a great marketing tool? When you're out there trying to land, you know, clients and candidates you're going to represent, the answer is yes. They only care about themselves. They don't care about us. They just care about themselves. But if you've gone through a program that gives you more knowledge where you can service them better, um, obviously that's a very good use of your time. Okay, let me see if I have, I do have, I don't have any hands being raised, but I do see a question. So let me go to the question area. Let's see here. Okay. And let me open the questions. Okay, um, there also, by the way, is going to be, you know, we keep doing, we're going to keep doing these webinars, so make sure that you're showing up for these Lunch with Barb webinars. You know, this is something that is uh, just a, an added value of being a member of TechServe Alliance. I want you to make sure. Um, I have a question now, how many people have passed the exam? Most of the people that are taking the exam right now are passing the exam because, you know, most people that have taken it so far read the study guide. You know, many of them have attended a prep class and then they take the program plus the passing percentage right now for the certification exam is 70%. That will be raised to 80% at the TSA conference this fall. So if you want to take the certification exam, and, and, and most certification programs do that. When you initially roll out a certification program, you're going to make the passing ratio a little bit lower because you want to make sure the exam is fair. You want to make sure the questions are fair. And what we've proven to ourselves by the hundreds of people that have gone through the program now is that there is no one question that's tripping everybody up. You know, the, the exam, if you, if you read the study materials and you take notes, you will pass. And so the passing percentage is 70 right now. And most people are, are, are passing. The only people that do not pass, and I can tell you this for a fact, there's two people that don't pass. It's a person that just takes the prep class, and they think they can come to a prep class and not read the study materials. At the last TSA conference, I had you know a couple people that came. They didn't read the study guide. They took my prep class, and they went right back to their room, got online, and took the exam and failed. Because the prep class gives you an overview of the, you know, of the best, you know, of the highlights of what's in the study guide, but it can't give you the knowledge of the study guide. So you need to read the study guide. The other people that don't pass are people that go back and change answers. Almost 100% of the time, people that have changed an answer change it to a wrong answer. So if you change answers or you, you know, or you don't, um, you know, you don't read the study guide, you will, you will fail. I am new or to the profession. Will this help me get better at my job? Yes. If, whether you've got six months of experience or you've got 20 years under your belt, the information in the certification program and in that study guide will absolutely help you make more money. And again, that was the only reason I got involved is I believe in certification and it, it really does you know, help you get better at working your desk. It helps you make more money and be more successful. And that's all that TechServe Alliance cares about. I mean, TechServe, everything they do is to basically enhance you know, the experience of their members. Let's see, this is from Priya. To take the CPSR2 certification, what are the prerequisites other than having passed C 
CPSR1. I, yeah, I should mention there are two levels to the certification program, level one and level two. Obviously, this individual took level one. To take the second level exam, all you have to do is register, you know, and you can contact the email address I gave you or you can basically call Susan. And then you do have to have two years of experience under your belt. So the level two exam is not for brand new people to the profession. They can take the level one exam, but to take the level two exam, you must have been in our profession for two years. Other than that, there is no prerequisite. You know, and those of you that, if there's anybody on here that took level two, level, I mean, level one, level two is all case studies, and it really tests your application of the knowledge that you've learned. So it's, again, it's a whole new level of knowledge and a whole new level of education that's going to help you better serve your clients and your candidates. I am in a slump. Any advice how to get out? If you're in a slump, um, I'm not sure if you're a recruiter or an account executive, I would have you monitor one stat, and that's send outs. If you want to get out of a slump, your job is to get people in front of decision makers. That's your job. Whether you're an account executive and you know candidates are being presented on your orders, or you're a recruiter and, and you're all focused on the candidate. So any of you that if you want to improve your sales, and you want the one thing that is going to make you more successful, get more people in front of decision makers. Nothing happens until you get people in front of decision makers. That's your job. In one sentence, your job is to get people in front of decision makers. Every day, where's your send out today? And my definition of a send out is candidate in front of a client, uh, a first interview. It could be phone or it could be face to face. You know, or it could be a you know, video interview. I don't care what the interview is, but it's that first interview. And you know, you just every month increase the number of send outs you book and you'll continually be more successful. That is the most important stat to monitor. Um, I'm getting a bunch of thank yous and several of you are asking more detailed questions about like the pricing and you know, how soon can you take the exam. I would tell you that if you signed up for the certification program today and you got the study materials and you spent, you know, you should read the study materials through once and then you should go back and read it a second time and take notes. And then, you know, if you have an opportunity to attend a prep class, you know, either at the TSA conference or there's some chapters that are, you know, that are um, basically bringing me in to do a prep class. Or if you're from a larger company and you have a number of people that want to register for the certification exam, we can actually set up a prep class for your company, you know, if you have multiple people. So, you know, it's a matter of just reaching out to TechServe Alliance. But you should be able to sign up for the exam and within 30 to 45 days take the exam and pass if you put Apple Time in. Um, they are going to send out a link, by the way, with this webinar and that has all the information. So when you get the link to this webinar, um, Susan and the TechServe team are also going to send you a link on the certification program that will give you all the detail. And again, if you go to the TechServe Alliance website and you, you know, click on certification, there's a tremendous amount of information on the website. You know, TechServe Alliance has done a great job of really outlining all the benefits and you know, the differentiators of becoming certified. Um, will you be giving the prep class? Yes, I am the person that basically gives the prep class. And of course, there's a great advantage to that too because I wrote the study materials on the best practices side you know, and I'm very familiar with the exam. And so, you know, can I, can I prep you properly to take the exam and have the best chances of passing? Yes. You don't have to take the prep class before you take the exam. Um, it's just an added, you know, an added benefit if you can. Okay, I see no more questions. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Remember, we're doing these calls once a month. This is a value-added service provided to you by TechServe Alliance. And for those of you that are not members who might be on this phone, um, I can tell you membership in your professional association is just, it's becoming a given. I mean, if you're in this niche, you need to join your professional association. And if you're doing IT, engineering, accounting, and finance, contracting, or direct placement, TechServe Alliance does a great job, a great job of providing services and information, and they really, really take care of their members. And so they don't pay me to give a commercial at the end. Um, as a speaker, I speak at all different associations, and I am a firm believer in what TechServe Alliance does for their members. I've said over and over again that they are my, my favorite association, professional association, and I've been the chairman of the board of other associations, but I feel the TechServe Alliance does the best job right now for their members. So, you know, consider membership. 
um, consider having your people go through the certification program. If you're not an owner and you're listening to this call, please pass this information and pass the link and everything on to your owner or manager because it will help you get better at what you do and you'll enjoy more success and your owner will, ingest, uh, well, your owner will enjoy higher sales and profits. So thanks for joining me today. I don't know if anybody from TSA, you know, do you have anything else you'd like to add before I end the call? Um, yeah. So everyone, we hope that you will join us for the next webinar in the certification webinar series, which is the best use of your time, and this will be presented by you, Barb, again. And it will be on July 9th, and it starts at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, this program will address exemplary practices that should be implemented in your business by your entire team. This information will have your team working more efficiently. And this webinar addresses the final two certification program industry best practices. Um, with that, Barb, I would like to say thank you on behalf of TechServe Alliance and everyone attending. Thank you very much, Barb. You know, I want to add one thing. I got one more question that came in. Somebody asked if there is a prep class given at conference. Yes, there will be. And I will be giving the prep class at this year's TSA conference. But my challenge to all of you listening to my voice is why would you wait to conference to sign up for this program? You know, why would you not get this knowledge and start implementing it where you can have a record second, you know, third and fourth quarter of this year? So if you want to wait, yes, we do do the prep class at conference, but between you and I, you know, I, I, you know, the best time to sign up is right now. We're adding new questions. We're adding new materials in the fall exam. And so, you know, why not make the commitment right now to just basically, you know, become the best at what you're doing? So that's all I have to say, Jennifer. And again, it's always it's always a pleasure and an honor for me to represent TechServe Alliance. So I, I really appreciate you, you know, having me do these weekly call I mean these monthly calls for your members. Great. Thank you, Barb. And everyone, we will be sending out an email with today's slides in the link to today's presentation, as well as a link to the certification webpage where you can find out more information about certification. Thank you everyone for attending and have a nice day. Bye-bye.